Hi everybody, my name is Natalie Yeadon and I'm the, uh, one of the co-owners and managing directors with Impetus Digital. And for those of you who do not know what Impetus Digital is, our company has built some of the best in class asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration tools for life science companies. They use Impetus for doing things like um, advisory boards, virtual advisory boards, investigator meetings, co-author working groups, and unfortunately, since COVID-19, we've had a flurry of people coming in to virtualize their in-person, you know, brand planning sessions and sales rep POA rollouts, et cetera. So we've been having uh, a lot of fun helping our clients acclimatize to this new environment. At Impetus Digital, we really believe that everything starts with a thought. So although we've been doing what we've been doing for the last 11 years, um, we are, um, we actually are uh, finding that people are just sort of discovering this new technology, just like people are discovering telemedicine for the first time. But we do think that everything starts with a thought and starts with a big, hairy, audacious conversation. And it's really the premise behind having some of these fireside chats with provocative thinkers like Ariel and other people that we've been speaking with. When we do something a little different, a little out of the norm, something that kind of pushes the boundaries, these are the kinds of conversations that can really truly positively disrupt healthcare, and which is all what we're really excited about participating in. As you know, I'm also the Toronto lead for the transformative technology community. And this community is a group or an ecosystem of startup companies, uh, small businesses, people who are very entrenched and involved in the neurotech, wellness, um, the mental health space. And I know that we're all kind of rallying around here because Ariel is really a connoisseur and a pioneer in this space. So the idea here with the trans tech is we want to affect the lives of a billion people by the year 2030. So here we are. Um, I was actually just mentioning to Ariel before we came to this session that I'm super excited. I've been a biohacker for years and one of the original users of the Muse and uh, never thought I would actually be able to speak to her directly. So I'm um, really, truly inspired and very excited here. So a little bit of background. I know many of you already know and heard of Ariel, but for those of you who don't know, she is the founder of Interaxon. They are the makers of this beautiful little device that has changed the world on what it means and how it feels to meditate. And Muse is the award-winning uh, winning headband that makes meditation so tangible for our, the, the, the rest of our scattered brain people that live in this world. Um, and during guided exercises, Muse senses your brain activity and sends that information to your phone or to your tablet and gives you real-time audio feedback that helps you take the guesswork. Am I doing meditation right? Am I wrong? Am I focusing? Am I thinking about my shopping or grocery list or what's going on here? So um, what's really cool is Ariel actually studied neuroscience at the University of Toronto, so my alma mater. So very happy about that and worked in labs in Toronto's Grembrill Neuroscience Centre. She was researching Parkinson's disease and hippocampal neurogenesis. So really, really smart gal. No mere science nerd, Ariel is also a beautiful fashion designer whose clothing opened Toronto Fashion Week in 2003 and has had her work displayed at the Art Gallery of Ontario. So Ariel's uncommon combination of science and art has been an integral part of the muse and the design and their unique approach to everything they've done around sensing technology. Ariel is also a therapist in private practice. We're gonna to wanna to find out a little bit about that. As well as her full-time position at Muse, Ariel also keynotes around the world on technology, mindfulness, and entrepreneurship, and supports a variety of different startups. So welcome, welcome, Ariel. We're all very excited that you're here. Thank you. It's my sincere honor and pleasure to be here, and thank you for such a lovely introduction. Oh, it's so awesome. I felt such a great vibe there. Um, we are really excited about you as a person, and you know, equally, I think. Um, I don't usually like to gravitate about, you know, gender specifics or, you know, men and women and all those sorts of things. But sometimes there is a certain level of reality that we've hit, especially since you were a pioneer in the space, in, in the STEM space. Maybe you can actually share with us a little bit about 
what drove you to start studying science in the first place? Sure. Um, and yeah, I was a female CEO in tech in the early 2000s, long before it was cool to be a female in tech, long before people actually wanted to fund you because you were female or support your business because you were female. So, you know, it's, it's been a fascinating road watching world evolve as we continue to do this. In my own background, I, my mom was an artist, so I grew up with these beautiful large-scale oil on canvases in a very inspired like, environment. And I was always curious about how the world worked. Why do we see those things on a canvas as a picture? You know, how do we create images in our mind? How to create thoughts from the things that we see in front of us? Why are tables hard? All of these questions fascinated me. So I went to school first for science and actually even in high school had a job in a research lab doing embryonic stem cell research as a like kind of junior researcher co-op position um, when I was 17 and at the same time had a clothing line and was curious about how we create experiences during using art. And then went to school for neuroscience and began collaborating with Dr. Steve Mann. He's one of the inventors of the wearable computer and from for anyone in Toronto, he is a professor at the University of Toronto and really a staple of the Toronto science and engineering scene. And we began creating these concerts where people were being able to make music with their mind. We would put a single EEG electrode on the back of your head and by shifting your brain state, let you focus or relax, move your brain around in order to affect sound. And from there, we went on this absolutely wild journey with myself, my co-founder, Chris Amini and Trevor Coleman to take that technology and turn it into news. Oh, it's just, it's just absolutely fantastic. When you were doing fashion designing, did anybody sort of poo poo any of the work that you were trying to endeavor in the science space? Did you feel that at any point there was some gender bias that was happening or you know the fact that you were in design or art that that doesn't have or didn't have any relevance in the science space yeah so i'm now 40 and so when i was growing up it was weird to be an artist and a scientist people would ask me all the time how can you do both things aren't art and science incredibly different and today when we have such a you know deep intersection between technology, science, experience, you know, with digital technology, you have to be creating experiences that are beautiful, that are graphical, that sound amazing, and all are also deeply technical and functional. So today those areas have merged, but 20, 30 years ago, it was incredibly odd for anyone to think that art and science could be the same thing, that they could take similar thinking processes. You know, when you're creating a garment, you both have to have a creative thought, you know, design something new in your mind, put together ideas to generate something new. And then you have to have a very technical path that you take to execute it. And in science, you have to have a leap of imagination, an idea, like what is this thing I'm going to investigate? How might this work? And then you have a very set processes that you follow in order to come to the other side and prove that this works or doesn't work. So both take, you know, creative approaches and technical approaches merged together. And we now recognize that they're maybe not so dissimilar from one another, but I definitely had people look at me like I was a strange bird, um, you know, wonder how can you be an art and science at the same time? There was also definitely something gendered about it that, you know, being in fashion was a female thing, being in science was potentially more of a male thing. And how are you bridging these two worlds? And I, luckily always got accepted for doing both and, and actually lauded for doing both at the same time. But there are definitely moments where you could see the tension on people's faces of what's going on here. What's the gender play? What's the intersection of these things that shouldn't cross? So I, you bring up so many relevant things and I just kind of want to pull the thread on a few of those. Um, one of them I think is really interesting is the new creative. I mean, we hear all the time about the concept of flow and we're probably going to get into that in a little bit in a moment the great works of, you know, me, um, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi and other great writers and pontificators in the positive psychology space. But just lingering on that area around creativity in the Silicon Valleys, and I use that word loosely because there's Silicon Valleys all over the world now, um, including Toronto, which is a huge AI, you know, epicenter of the world. So, when we discover or discuss these ideas or when people come to Ariel and say, you know, how do I create or, you know, how do I come up with the newest muse? 
have you do you find that you're using this idea that before you know even the way we looked at school subjects is here is art and here is science and the two are very you know different do you feel that this has now become a mainstay are writers now talking about the new creative of being this 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 place where we're bringing and bridging all of this together and is that really truly the way for people to succeed for this ecosystem of startups that we're speaking to today so we're absolutely understanding that cross-pollination of ideas is required for creativity. I mean, that's the entire diversity conversation we're having today. If there's not diversity around your table, you're missing ideas. You're not having, you know, idea, other idea, synthesis to better idea. And so you absolutely need an interplay of multiple disciplines. We could not have created Muse. We could have never made this if I wasn't somebody interested in bridging art and science. And if Chris Amini, the my technical co-founder, wasn't himself an unbelievable engineer who is also an artist and somebody who is incredibly spiritual. So for all of us, this bridging of these multiple paths was essential because had we created a technical tool that could read your brain, that would be cool, but nobody would use it because it wouldn't be compelling. It wouldn't be emotional. It wouldn't be human. It had to have a beautiful user experience. It had to have music that sounded wonderful, that made you feel. It had to be able to reflect your internal state in this really noumenal way. It had to be a piece of art that also had crazy technical capability built on strong science. So, you know, we were, I'm not gonna say the vanguard, but you know, we were on the earlier edge of bridging these arts simultaneously, um, along with another, a number of other scientists, artists like David Rokeby and Steve Mann is also both an artist and a scientist and an inventor. Um, but now you're seeing that as de facto. People are understanding that, you know, most of the amazing visual effects that we see that are coded in, you know, processing or any of the other coding languages are somebody who has deep technical skill to be able to code it and somebody who has an amazing emotional aesthetic quality and is able to see it. Like all of the CG that we see, all of the cartoons, all of the amazing websites, all of the interactive visual displays, all of the amazingly technical, you know, sound innovations that we hear. All of these things that touch us in this emotional and human way are created by craftsmen who are incredibly technically capable. And the language of that technical capability today is, you know, computer processing and signal processing and things that we had divorced previously from art. You know, there's so many cool things in there and I'm going to divert because I do want to come back obviously to the, the art around news and where that all started, but you bring up some important things that I think are important. And that is really on, I think we're creating a society of like super geniuses. Information is coming at us in a flash. Knowledge is free. It's everywhere and we're having really smart, abled individuals to piece these things together and into creating these sensorial decadent moments. And what I think is really fascinating is, um, like you're saying, is crossing that bridge and almost delving into the fractals of, of everything. And so I guess, you know, the Steve Kotlers of the world have written books about, you know, and who are what you would call, um, uh, you know, the ra the rationalists, right? So uh, everything kind of breaks down is, do you believe that art and beauty and sensorial decadence all breaks down into biological codes? Are we kind of getting into this place to think about this as a collective wisdom? Because I think the next concept to you is, as we bring people together into a meditative state or into a collective consciousness, are we just one big giant robot? So I, I know there's a lot of questions in there, but there's something hidden in that that I think is really ripe for discovery. That is a fascinating question that you just seated there. Um, and I, okay, so, so as a society, we are a large organism working together. And anything that we do individually affects who and what we are as a society. Um, and I tend to think that the greatest thing that we can create as individuals is something as individuals is something that's going to move the society forward. You know, when we think about the lives that we can live and the choices that we make, you can live a life that's just for you. Um, and then you live and then you die and that was your life. Or you can live a life that is oriented towards moving the entire organism forward in whatever small way that you do. And then we all evolve through it. And I think we're at a point where we're seeing a tremendous moment of personal evolution um, and possibly a moment of societal de-evolution. It's, it's 
frightening and fascinating simultaneously. But we're seeing a point at which we have the unusual number of inputs to the individual. So like my kid just turned four. He's been watching his tablet since he was one because my husband's a game designer and an animator and you know, you give your kid a tablet. Um, and he, the inputs that my child has at the age of four are beyond mind blowing. He is constantly telling me about how the world works, how electricity works, how his organs work, how his heart is beating, that his brain is having this thought. Uh, he tells me about his dreams and how he's able to shift and move his dreams. Uh, and yet this is not like some weird sloopy thing. This is just, he has the amount of input that I had as a teenager or even, you know, entering university, the like information that I did not have access to about how the mind and the body and the world works. It's just, it's breakfast to him. It's just the normal, information he's imbibing. And he may not perfectly understand how all those pieces weave together yet, but he's going to have a much greater holistic understanding of the world decades before <laughs> most of us did. Um, and any child has access to this. He's not doing anything special. He's watching YouTube kids for God's sake. And so I really sit there and wonder what is the kind of, um, who is he going to become and who is this generation of children who have the same inputs? how are they going to be able to see the world differently? How are they going to be able to see the problems, see the interconnections, and then create a new set of solutions from it? So you have the one trajectory of information, which is allowing us to change our inputs and then therefore dramatically change our outputs. And then you have the second trajectory of the personal evolution. So, you know, for 2000 years, people have been talking about meditation and meditation's ability to manage your mind, focus your attention, uh, open yourself to compassion, create greater connection. You have the narratives of Christianity, which are very focused also on prayer and connecting, you know, creating connection to one another and mankind, um, though those have been warped and co-opted in all sorts of ways through the years. But you're now having this resurgence of meditation as a technology and as a force for human evolution that is attempting to teach us how to overcome our own physiology and our own, you know, internal wiring and base desires and, you know, kind of uh, more animalistic humanity and teaching us, you know, techniques, whether they're from the breath or quieting the mind or self-observation or overcoming our ego or connecting to one another in deeper ways. You know, they're teaching these techniques that allow a different, um, a, a form of human evolution. And so, you know, on the one hand, we see these incredibly um, positively evolving, what I perceive as positive, none of us actually know, what I perceive as positively evolving um, momentum towards, you know, a self-development and a self-evolution, which will be slow. I mean, our next generation will learn it faster and we'll get there. Um, and an incredible input and a different technological structure around us, which allows rapid acceleration of ideas. Um, and that is undeniably binding us in new ways, connecting us to new ideas and pushing us forward. At the same time, we have this, you know, fraction of the world who is becoming more um, uh, personally involved, is closing up their borders and their boundaries, is creating schisms, um, is, you know, intentionally, when you look at you know, Trump, for example, is intentionally trying to drive wedges between people rather than bring them together. Um, you have a pandemic that is making us more scared than ever. You, we have a world that's becoming more fractioned. Um, and I truly don't know what's going to come out of this moment. You know, the idealist in me hopes that from this fraction, fractioning, we will come out with something, you know, better. We will come out with something that is more oriented towards human good and connection and less greed. Um, but we have too many forces working against us simultaneously at this moment. And I think there are, um, I think it's going to be a long time coming until we see a, a, an evolution to a place where most of the people on the line would agree that we want to be. And so I think I'm really ripping here. I've gone well off your question. Oh, no, it's um, but great. It was, yeah. it's such an open, you know, mess that you oh, gave yeah. me that I, that I wanted to keep winding with it. Absolutely. Um, I'm just running with it too. Yeah. So I think we're, you know, we're in a place where if we look at what is it, what is it that I can do personally, which is the question that I'm constantly asking, I sort of falls down to, you know, three things. Um, evolve yourself to be the person that you hope to be. 
um, support the people around you in ways that create greater openness and greater connection and break down barriers and walls and work as hard as you can to you know work on the larger societal problems that are going to lead to the world that you hope to see because it takes you know work and advocacy if you care about environmental issues then you know support greenpeace you know share information make changes in your life if you care about social issues you know go and protest whatever it is you know it is it is all of us as an organism working against each other and together to try to create the world that we want to see um, yeah so cool so cool. i actually wrote a book a couple of years ago called the healthcare heretic which um, talks very much, but it's honestly very timely now. So I'm just getting an audio book written with the, uh, the audio version of it. But Congratulations. Um, so amazing. thank you. Thank you. So true, though. And I really do need to ask you. So where does Muse fit into that aspiration in that inspiration to being everything that we can be? So some people would look at this as just a scientific tool of just getting my breath down. But you might be also speaking to the hearts and minds of people who believe in the energetic value of the human experience. Um, what exactly is this human experience? And what exactly is behind these various fractious viewpoints? And are they just sort of collective vibrations that, you know, of other people's sense of reality just kind of conglomerating and congealing together and creating a force while other people have their own versions of reality and they're congealing on their collective version and everybody's experiencing these fractious circuits that somehow bang up against each other, almost like the, um, the double slit experiment. And we'll see if it lands in this way or lands in this way, it's anybody's kind of guess. But where does Muse fall into this? And, and, and the whole concept of, of vibration and of thinking and of consciousness and really, I guess, the essence behind what meditation is. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm trained as a scientist, so I can't comment on vibration and how it relates to, you know, our consciousness because we don't know what the link there is yet. Um, but I can kind of step back a few steps. So with Muse, what we do is we teach you a focused attention meditation practice. So we teach you to calm your mind, to be able to stay in focused attention and to stay out of your negative ruminating thoughts. And as you do this, as you cultivate your meditation practice, what happens is you're able to start to examine your own thinking without getting caught up in it. So rather than hearing stories and believing them to be true um, or feeling emotions in your body and believing that the world must be that way because you feel this thing, you know, fear, anxiety, whatever it is, you're now able to, to create a, um, a more rational prefrontal cortex dominated approach to understanding your internal space and the world around you. So you're able to start to actually analyze, oh, you know, I feel like when we look at unconscious bias, I feel like, you know, when I look at this photo of a person who is different than me, I feel a jump in my stomach, I feel discomfort, I feel closing off, and I have these thoughts of aversion. Is that, are all of those things true? Do all of those things need to be? Or was this simply a conditioning that was brought upon me? Was this somebody else's story? Was this my amygdala reacting to, to somebody else's fear um, because I heard it from them? Um, or I, you know, I culturally assumed it. And so through the practice of meditation, we are able to observe what goes on in our mind and our body, um, accept what goes on in our mind and our body, but not be driven by what goes on in our mind and our body and be able to make different choices. So to me, you know, when we look at this incredibly fractured world that you described with people's ideas in echo chambers with one another, bouncing up against one another, um, what meditation allows you to do is to start to deconstruct that echo chamber, whether the echo chamber is inside yourself or inside the world around you, and uh, allows you to in increase your ability to have metacognition. So in your meditation practice, rather than being caught up in your thoughts, you're able to rise above them and observe them. So we can do the same thing societally. We, instead of being caught up in the mess, we can rise above it and observe it and then make wise choices. And so much of these echo chambers are based on the idea of difference and the idea of uh, animosity. This person is different than me, therefore they must want something different than me, therefore they must be a threat to me. And as soon as you, through you know, a meditation practice or other means, 
are able to open to the fact that somebody who is different, who wants something different, is not threatening to you. At probably actually at the core, you both want exactly the same thing, you know, happiness for yourself and safety for your family. Just how the narratives have interpreted it become very, very different. Um, when you can start to open your heart to the people around you and the people at a distance from you and believe that fundamentally you are the same, which is one of the core tenets of meditation and of you know, the, the idea of a collective consciousness, that we are all just manifestations of the same. And you don't have to see that in a spiritual realm. Um, that, that is also just a, you know, it is a biological fact. We are, we are all the same species. We are all one and the same. Um, you know, we, we all ultimately want the same things for ourselves and for one another. Um, when you can start to really understand the connectedness of humanity in that sense, it then becomes impossible to want bad for somebody else because you're looking at the overall organism. It becomes impossible to want bad for the world. And then the competing desires that you have, you know, I both want to be incredibly, you know, I want to have all of the wealth in the world, but I also don't want everybody else to be poor. To recognize the competing narratives there, once you start to recognize those, that those things, shit, they can't both be true. I can't have all the wealth and everybody else also have wealth. Then you start to try to find new systems and new ways of being and start to deconstruct your own beliefs in order to interact with people in a world in a more equitable way. So let's actually just <clears throat> um, linger on some of that for just a few minutes, <clears throat> because really what I'm hearing you say is that the core tenant behind meditation, and, and again, Muse is a really phenomenal tool to help train the scientists of us, the people who have scatter brains or very busy brains, which is actually all of us, monkey mind. Um, you know, it is a great tool to be able to train, train ourselves. I'm hearing you say that what we're really ultimately seeking is the pause. And I think the word pause is probably one of the greatest words that we could ever discover in our lives, because if we can actually slow, slow the, the reptilian brain or the, the knee jerk reaction, or you call it the amygdala, the amygdala overload, and putting in that moment of pause so that the cerebral cortex or the thinking brain can actually take a logical next step. Um, I, I'm hearing that pause is one of the greatest things that we can actually do. Um, and so the, the ability to observe our emoting parts without clinging or resisting, or you're talking about with an open heart. And so I guess as we look at the events of today, we're looking at people emerging out of the quarantine of the COVID-19 pandemic. We're seeing people kind of rising through the ashes of the, you know, the burning phoenix of the recent protests that have been going on and the, the revelations of bias, bias occurring both, both in our natural lives, but also the bias being built into artificial intelligence and the smart machines and all these other things. It's just the concept of bias. Maybe you can actually deliver or tell us what your thoughts are about pause and how you think this can be translated into um, more uh, trustable technology, a more livable community, um, and then the evolution of what we're going to be seeing in society moving forward. So this idea of pause. Okay. Um, another amazingly meaty question. So I should start by clarifying, you know, meditation doesn't have, there are many different forms of meditation and they have many goals and ends and many interpretations of those forms, um, whether it's, you know, spiritual, secular, metaphysical, there's, there's all sorts of ways to look at meditation. I'm presenting, you know, my lens on it. Um, and Muse is a tool, teaches you meditation, and then you take your lens on it. And I'm not here to impose, impose a lens on how you, how you roll with it. Just wanted to clarify that piece because it's hard to say, you know, when you look, the greatest thing in meditation is, or, you know, the core of meditation is. Um, pause is certainly an essential component and something that I think when we look in these COVID times um, was one of the greatest gifts of COVID. You know, something that people have been yearning for is a pause. We all feel like we're on a treadmill. We all feel like the world is accelerating around us. Um, and, and it is, you know, technology is moving at a greater pace than it ever has. Technology allows our lives to move at a greater place, pace than they ever have. It allows for all sorts of efficiencies, which 
on the one hand, create efficiencies and create more time and space, but on the other hand, just create more stuff that can be happening to you, around you, and for you simultaneously at all times. Um, and so the idea of meditation is very appealing to people because during the act of meditation, you create a pause. And then the skill that meditation builds is the skill of allowing you to pause as you move on. And the pause itself is, oh, you know, it is that moment for your fight and flight system to go, ha, ah, to release. It's the moment for your vagus nerve to say, yes, we can go and rest and digest. We can be intended of a friend. You know, we can just, ha. Ah. So I think most of us, crave the pause. Um, most of us, when we find the pause, find it incredibly peaceful. And when you look at the idea of peace, peace, I think, is something that so many of us crave so desperately right now. You know, peace on the one hand is the, please make it all go away, make it stop. Um, and peace is the, please, can we all be together? Can we all be whole? Um, you know, the, the word healing is, the root of the word healing is to make whole. Um, and something, something that is whole is there and complete. It's, it's not in stasis, um, but it is, it is, it is complete in itself. And so I think, I think the pause is incredibly important. And as we look back in history, we, we may refer to the first moments of COVID as the great pause. You know, the time when everything stopped, when we couldn't go out, when we couldn't work, when we couldn't do all of these things. We just had to pause. Now, a pause is just temporary. There's something that happens after a pause. And I think we don't quite know what the great reset or restart is going to be. I love the idea and the analogy in life about the pendulum. And that when the pendulum doesn't stop, you're basically dead. So you need the constant movement. It's, it's motion, it's vibration. That's why I use, I do think that vibration is very much of a scientific aspect to meditation. It's the, it's the movement and the sine wave of life. The pendulum concept of, you know, going from extreme ends of, you know, complete happiness, satisfaction to complete level, levels of contrast that we invite into our life so that we can feel the swing and the upswing of experience of positivity. So that might be an extreme view on some of these terrible things that happen. But really, if you look at the silver lining of, of some of these unfortunate things that have been happening in the world, is looking at that as... Um, maybe in some ways we've invited that so that we can feel the elation of the upswing as the pendulum moves to the other side. So I just want to take a few minutes back to kind of come back to the basics of you delving into a space with some other men working as founders. Do you feel that you were on some sort of a spiritual rising in yourself that there might have been a quote unquote allowing in yourself or a certain vibration that you were attracting these people? How did you know they were the right people to go into business with? You know, why did you land on these individuals? Um, I got incredibly lucky, incredibly, incredibly lucky. Um, so Chris was Steve's master student and just one of the most, you know, brilliant engineers I could ever hope to meet. And we were very close friends. And Trevor Coleman, our third business partner, was actually my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, his best friend. Um, and he was great at business. He was great at creating experiences that were fun. He was actually a club promoter at the time, completely unlikely, you know, pairing. Um, but he knew how to create events that people loved and circumstance that people could thrive in. Um, and the three of us got together and we had two other co-founders um, who sort of sloughed off and it was the three of us who remained and we would get together regularly in Trevor's basement working on business plans for a business that didn't exist. And I have no idea how that, you know, karma or kismet or moment came together, that it was, that it was the three of us, but it really was the magic pairing. It really was the, this couldn't have existed without that chemistry of the three of us. Um, we joke that I was the gas pedal. I'd be like, we got to do this. I can see it. Like, I can taste it. Yes, we're going to go. We're going to go to Silicon Valley. We're going to raise money. We're going to make a prototype. We're going to do these things and it's going to work. Um, regardless of whether I knew what I was talking about or now or not. I've never raised money in my life. I'd never done any of these things. But like, I could see it. I knew this could work. Um, um, Chris was the engine because he was the technical genius who could stay up all night and actually translate these ideas into reality. And Trevor was the break. Trevor was the one who would say, but we don't have a contract for that. Is this legal? 
are you sure? Um, and, and typically, I, we didn't have a contract for that. I had no idea if it was legal and couldn't care less, and I wasn't sure. But it didn't matter because I knew that this is what we needed to do. Um, and I don't think I knew in any like preternatural way. I couldn't see the future. I just had this deep conviction in in myself that this must be possible and if it was possible we could figure out and therefore we would do it and it was so clear and compelling and it provided the inspiration for trevor and chris to be able to come on board and, and you know chris who at that point was pretty skeptical as an engineer be like i don't know what we're doing but ariel says this this is gonna you know gonna work so we're just gonna do it um and, you know, he could put his inner critic out of the way and I could, you know, be the cheerleader. And, and somehow it was really the chemistry of the three of us that allowed this incredibly Im improbable, impossible thing to happen. And so what was most improbable at the time? So what were the biggest barriers and challenges that you found was the hardest thing to get through at the beginning? <laughs> there were so many of them. <laughs> it was like, how do you start? So I started in the lab in 2002 with Steve Mann. Um, Chris, Trevor, and I sort of started to get together like 2006, five, six. By 2007, we were like, okay, we're going to do this. By 2009, we'd incorporated. And by 2009, you know, we had no money. We had the money that I had made myself in my bank account. Um, I was 20 whatever at the time. Um, you know, it was not a ton of money. Um, we, I had no formal business background. I'd never raised money before. Um, we had the completely unproven technology. The first big project we did was at the Olympics, where people at the Olympics got to control the lights on the CN Tower, Canadian Parliament, and Niagara Falls with their brain from across the country. And we executed that in 2010. And when we started the project in 29, we were literally three people in a basement with an unproven technology, um, you know, with, wow. with like with nothing. And we were like, we could do this. And it, we actually pulled it off but we had to figure out how you got brain data out of people's head in a reliable way, how you taught them how their brain works, what the metaphors were to understand the mind. Um, we had to network our technology 2000 miles across the country and interface with the lighting on the CN Tower in Niagara Falls. We had to teach thousands of people, all with no language, because this was at the Olympics and it had to work in any language, how to control their brain in a short period of time. Like this was all improbable. You know, ultimately, you know, we've raised tens of millions of dollars and I had to stand in front of VCs and say, hey, I can, you know, we have a device that's going to read your brain and it's going to be amazing. Please give me money. Um, I have no bad business background and, you know, whatever, but yes, we'll do this. And by the way, I'm a tiny little girl, five foot two with long hippie hair from Toronto who you've never heard about and somehow make all that work. That is phenomenal. I do want to ask you, so well, who are the initial backers? Who did you end up just meandering through the town and found an incubator? Did somebody connect, somebody who knew somebody connect you to somebody at Mars? Somebody said, I know an investor. Like, how did all of those building blocks come in your way? Did you strive for them or did it just happen through networks? It was a combination of both. So it was, you know, my drive that this could happen. Like that was, that was the, um, so in 2008, I Googled, um, something and came up with Mars and I reached out to Mars and said, Hey, I'm starting a startup before like startups were a thing in Toronto. We are one of Mars's very first clients. Um, and so they taught us how to pitch. Um, I started speaking at conferences and through that, you know, created a significant network. Um, and when it came time to raise money, I had been invited to speak at MIT. And so I said, okay, I'm going to Boston. There are investors in Boston. Um, I should probably pitch to them. So Mars helped us with, with the pitch. I cold emailed with an intern that I had, probably a hundred investors. Um, maybe three of them replied. The only ones that replied were Canadian and felt some sense of you know, kinship to me as a Canadian wanting to support me. So that was, those were my first investor pitches. I did one pitch before I left as a test. It was to Omer's because I figured they'd never in a million years invest in me. It turns out that uh, years later they led my series B. Um, and it really was just always this feeling that I can do it. And with that feeling, um, the desire to reach out to people and to show them what we are doing and connect with them and let them know why this was important. 
And it was that, you know, forward momentum of networking that got us connection after connection after connection and people who ultimately joined onto our team and opened their checkbooks. Yeah. And these days, I guess of the curiosity here now is, you know, there's angel investors and there's funding galore and there's pathways to doing all of this. And so being a pioneer in that space, I mean, obviously the drive uh, really speaks to being able to achieve something. So with all of those resources available to people today, do you see that there's new challenges that people need to overcome perhaps and overcrowding? perhaps um, too many people doing the same thing. What's, what would be some words of advice that you give to people today actively seeking funding, especially in a world where a lot of uh, VCs are busy just trying to pat the backs of the people that they're currently working with and nobody wants to take any big risks. What's, what's your thoughts there? Sure. Um, and yes, the path is much, much, much easier now in so many ways. I mean, we had to figure out how to get hardware manufactured in China, never knowing anyone who'd ever manufactured hardware in China. Um, and now there are dozens of incubators and you join the incubator and they'll put you through the path of manufacturing in China. It's very simple. Um, with that has indeed come an overcrowding. You know, we could get money early on. And now if you're trying to make a brain sensing headband that helps you meditate, you're going to have to go to a VC and have us and you know eight other people on your competition slide and the VC say why should we invest in you when this already exists um, so we were really lucky that we found that blue ocean opportunity um, but it was also incredibly hard to have that blue ocean opportunity now you're looking at people who are making incremental changes um, and incremental improvements but also still people who are making fundamental leaps forward there are there's with the creation of new technology creates a ton of new opportunity for what that technology can do. You know, um, AI is hot because AI can do so many things, has the potential to revolutionize so many industries. And if you have a startup and you're doing something exactly the same as somebody else, you're probably not going to succeed. There are currently a thousand meditation apps in the app store, but you, so you're not going to succeed in getting VC funding. But I think people are forgetting that there are multiple models to exist within a business. You know, most people used to have mom and pop businesses. You'd have large transnational companies, you'd have some middle tier businesses, and then the majority of people had a mom and pop business. You had a corner store, a grocery store that supported a local ecosystem. Um, and you made enough money for yourself and your family to survive. And you didn't dream about making a billion dollars and returning, you know, money to your VCs fund. And so I think when you think about the kind of business that you're building, you know, there's only going to be so many Ubers, so many, so many huge companies, and those are the ones that investor, big investors want to invest in. But you also have to think, can I create a lifestyle business that's going to function for myself? Is there a niche in the market for me where I can just have an app that I have built myself that does something meaningful that people purchase um, and I make money? You know, is, is there some way that this can be a lifestyle business if it is not investable, because not all businesses are investable and many of this investable businesses fail. Yeah, it's so true. And another thing I think that's really important is a lot of young entrepreneurs, ones just coming out of university and great science programs, their immediate thought is that they've been socialized, that they have to get funding. And sometimes they're not um, they're not taught some of the, the idiosyncrasies or some of the misfortunes around selling your soul or selling your equity. And so I think equally um, educating people on sometimes bootstrapping or, or like you said, lifestyle or doing things in, in different ways or doing it slowly or growing more strategically might be the better route so that you, you know, can contain more of your equity um, over time. So what I think is also a really great question for you is you and your company have really focused on meditation. So using this really useful uh, EEG tool to read brain waves for the sake of meditation. Is there a reason, because there's a lot of companies that have been coming through sort of, you know, looking at a similar type of a headset, but using it more as a prescriptive digital therapeutic. So entering it into studies to study it now for the management of depression or anxiety or something that's more prescriptive. Can you speak a little bit about your decision there um, and why did you niche it in meditation? Sure. Um, so initially, the tool needed to be something in order to succeed. 
Um, so we went to market with an open platform initially um, and said, if you build it, they will come and we'll just have developers who build all sorts of cool things. And there were developers and they built cool things and that wasn't a business. Um, because the install base, the headset only grows as big as your ability to push it forward. Um, so early on, you know, we'd go to investor pitches and they'd be like, we have this headset, it can do all of these things here, education, health, fitness, blah, blah, driver's distraction, blah, 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 all these things it can do. And you'd be like, what do you think the killer app is? And we were like, meditation. And they're like, yeah, right, see you later. Um, it was another one of the challenges. Uh, it turns out that, you know, eight years later, the killer app truly was meditation. Mm. That is the killer app. That was the thing that we just happened to catch the zeitgeist of the market. We had a solution that really worked, that really made meditation easy, that really solved the problem that most people had of like, what's going on in my brain when I meditate? Because there's no coach or guru sitting in there to tell you what you're doing or if you're doing it right. And so we actually built something that truly solved that problem, that happened to actually be a real pain point that was growing as more people were meditating. Um, and we did it in a way that was compelling and people kept using it. And we now have hundreds of thousands of users. Along the way, um, Muse has been used in over 200 studies by researchers, both as a clinical grade EEG, using it for neuroscience research, um, as well as a meditation tool using meditation as a tool within healthcare. So we, Mayo Clinic just published a study with breast cancer patients awaiting surgery, demonstrating using Muse reduces the stress of surgery, uh, re reduces the stress of the cancer care process, improves quality of life and fatigue. Um, they now have five other studies that they'll be running over the course of the year. Um, Muse has been used uh, both as a meditation tool for pain management, as well as as a clinical grade EEG to look at the EEG of pain. Um, we now have a new device that we've built, Muse S, that also helps you sleep. So meditation was the thing that allowed the company to grow, allowed the technology to be robustified and all of the systems behind it to be robustified, you know, allowed an actual really important good to be delivered to the world. Cause I would say over and over again, if this isn't doing something good for people, throw it out. Like don't, don't bother if it's not actually gonna have a positive impact. And so meditation was kind of the thin edge of the wedge. And this is really Trevor's line. He'd always, always be like, meditation will be the thin edge of the wedge. And he's absolutely right. And so now that that's there, we're actually, you know, moving into the FDA path and looking at Muse as a digital therapeutic um, and have you know, dozens and dozens of studies and healthcare organizations using it for things like anxiety, depression, OCD. These, you know, these are all pain. These are all studies that are in process. Um, and are they are, are any of those phase three like are you closer to the edge point of becoming a prescriptive or, or in a prescription um so we're not close to becoming a prescription because it's a very very long process um but you know we have doctors we've had doctors recommending muse for years there's thousands of clinicians that recommend muse to their patients for a variety of conditions that it could help improve their life to to meditate while living with these conditions um, um, and so, you know, the digital therapeutic path to market is actually quite a new one. Um, and so, you know, we've been on it for a little bit and it, it takes time getting FDA approval for anything takes time. Um, so I can't put a, a clock on it yet. Yeah, absolutely. So that's perfect. I have some questions coming in and I'm just going to try to uh, mention sure. some of them. But uh, so first of all, I think somebody wanted to ask a question around if you've ever read the work of Ian Livingston. Uh, he's a designer of the Tomb Raider game in the UK. And he has talked about the need to teach STEAM and not just STEM in schools. Yeah. I mean, this was actually a little, little earlier on when you were talking about your four-year-old and being this brilliant little uh, jumble of, of energy and knowledge. Uh, are you aware of that? And what's your thoughts about that and what they're teaching in school? Um, so recently, you know, the conversation has moved from STEM to STEAM and, you know, as, as a woman in STEM, I was always asked, can you give women in STEM, you know, talks now it's women in STEM. Can you, sorry, for those people who don't know what the acronym, can you explain what STEM and STEAM is? Yep. So St STEM is science, technology, um, engineering, and mathematics. St STEAM is science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Um, so there's the, the fundamental recognition now that the art needs to be packaged into the, the engineering and the science in order to create, you know, somebody who can succeed in this new landscape. So 
Yes. Steam Love is key. <laughs> um, there's also a question around, you know, having this over exuberance and we need to have that to be able to push our companies forward. And did one of the questions that's come in here is, did you find that you needed to constantly find that balance between having your foot on the gas and staying open-minded and, um, you know, just, just more uh, allowing of other possibilities and other ideas um, and more customer centric. So if somebody came back to you and said, I really don't like this, like, did you stay open to that, um, to that kind of feedback? Yeah, you have to. And it's a really, really hard balance. Um, in my career as a fashion designer, I didn't know that balance yet. It was just like my idea. Um, I didn't really yet understand the tangible interaction between the customer and the idea. Um, and so actually that's the part of the artist part that needed to move because they, you know, my, my artist had a strong ego um, and my designer <laughs> didn't have a strong ego, the, the designer in me. And it's actually fascinating because the, the artist was associated with strong emotional response and the designer was actually, my, my, these are my own persona characteristics which I'm describing. The designer was associated with a much more objective, you know, even keeled approach to creating a solution. Um, so it was, it was always a challenge. And if you could keep the keel moving forward, that there was a way, but you didn't know what that way was, and you were going to keep trying things and navigating until you found the path forward, you know, that was the best mental framing for moving forward and being able to be open to whatever would come. Um, and navigate to the right solution rather than feeling like you knew the solution. So there is a north um, and it's my job to navigate to find it. Do you ever find it a bit of a challenge with that? I'm just thinking about the Elizabeth Holmes story from Theranos, who had very strong tendencies as many, many successful billionaires are, where they're really obstinate and tenacious. And, you know, we see those kind of characteristics in Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. You hear all kinds of horror stories about them slamming their hands on desks and talking. Do you see, and regardless of what we thought about lying or not lying or how somebody, somebody may actually say that somebody just got caught on a speed trap, but, uh, you know, because everybody else is it doing, do you feel that you're under more scrutiny because you're a female and there's certain expectations about how hard driving you can be in business? So I laughed when you said the words Austin. Um, and tenacious because those are words that my husband says to me with frustration all the time. <laughs> Why do you have to be so obstinate, so stubborn? You're so tenacious. Um, and it can be really frustrating to, you know, to, to your partner when, when you act that way. And it's something that is required to drive a business forward. Um, and one of the things that I'm learning as I grow and evolve as a person and as a leader is to let go of those qualities of obstinance and tenacity. Um, and to lead from below and support other people in their ideas and, and try to be a, a crafter who's gently guiding these ideas together rather than an obstinate and tenacious, you know, arrow that's trying to move forward. Um, I don't know that I could have succeeded and gotten to the place where Muse got to if I wasn't that obstinate, tenacious, you know, driven, per, driven char character. Um, um, and now that I am in a different place in my life and the, you know, the business is thriving, I, I, I can afford to lead from this place and take the time to learn how to lead from this place. I don't know what it would have looked like if I led from that place before. It might have been amazing and even more successful, um, but it's hard to see. As a woman, I don't know that I'm under more scrutiny for it. Um, um, I, think it's, I think it's a quality that just leaders in general are under scrutiny for, and it's such a difficult balance to know how to, you know, move an entire organization and concept forward and, and yet be able to do it in a way that's pulled back and inclusive and, you know, moving every, everyone with you. It's really hard. There's a final question before we close up. Somebody was asking, why did you uh, choose the Muse developer portal uh, for third-party developers when um, they could have been using a Muse headset, or sorry, third-party developers could use the Muse headset instead of using an API? Sure, um, happy to answer that. So we are still a resource strap startup. 
um, you know, making news is incredibly complicated and servicing the hundreds of thousands of users with a really complicated product is, and then gen creating new products. So we had Muse S, first Muse 2 that we were building, then Muse S that we were building. And once we built Muse 2 and Muse S, uh, they weren't backwards compatible with the SDK. So we had, because they had new sensors and were actually built on a new technology platform. Um, and then we we're porting all of our technology platform over. So, you know, we are always trying to do as much as we can and we just couldn't do that piece well. Um, we couldn't, we knew we needed to fix the SDK and get it to work with the new technology, but we didn't have the resources for it. And it was like, do we service, you know, the customer questions that are coming in about the sensor that needs to be fixed? You know, do we give them the new experiences for the $300 head, headband that they built that we designed a year ago, but didn't have the technical resources to put in? Um, you know, do we take the money and like build more headsets because building headsets is incredibly expensive? Do we hire one more customer care person to service the customers? Like, these are all difficult decisions to make. Um, and we've, you know, killed a lot of our own internal products that we didn't can keep building or keep supporting because we didn't have the money for it. And so when we looked at the developer community, like the SDK specifically, we realized we were doing a really bad job of keeping the SDK up to date. And it was going to require an absolute major overhaul in order to make it compatible with the new system. So we said, when we have the money to do that, when we can put the resources towards it at you know, our next big funding event or whatever it is, we can go back and focus on the SDK. In the meantime, we have a perfectly good API portal that really works that people can just use to get the data. Um, and build whatever you want that way. So that was the decision for the SDK. It was a painful one that had a lot of arguments back and forth about like, who do we, who do we not disappoint? Do we not disappoint the customer? Do we not disappoint the developer? How can we find the middle road? Um, and so we are, SDK is like, you know, still a big bubble when we, when we look at the big projects we want to do, you know, SDK is always up on the board. And as we rearrange the pieces and figure out what resources we have to accomplish it, like SDK is always there. We just have to find the right time in our development to do it. I love it. We are coming up close to the hour and I'm sure <clears throat> a lot of people have a closing time at this. So I don't, I want to be respectful of time. Honestly, Ariel, I think we, the questions are flowing through. <laughs> I wish I could ask you all of these questions, but um, suffice it to say, I'm sure there's many people who are looking to partner with you. As you know, I deal a lot with pharmaceutical and medical device companies. I'm sure many of them are probably having conversations, looking for partnership opportunities to fund you as you're going through the FDA process. And I'm sure if uh, you're ever interested in discussing that further, I'd love to talk to you more about it. But equally on the other side is always being aware as the, uh, as the person moving forward, this beautiful piece of technology, is um, ensuring that there's still a, a cohort of people using it for wisdom, love, and compassion. And sort of always kind of keeping, uh, keeping that balance of you know, uh, hardcore financing and using it with pharmaceutical companies and you know, the echelons of science, but also for the other piece, which is for um, the well-being of, of, uh, of us as human beings. So it has been an absolutely, uh, absolute pleasure for all of you who are attending. Um, we will be sending you a link to the recording of this video um, and we will also be posting this on various social media. So please look for that and for that email. Ariel, you are absolutely a um, breath of fresh air, such an inspiration to all of us. We feel your vibration and your positivity and uh, we wish you so much wonder and grandeur as, and very excited to probably see one day what your four-year-old might have to in store in the world for us as well. Thank you so much. This has been a joy and a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks to everybody and I hope everybody has a wonderful day.